Hi everyone, thank you for tuning in to our next installment of Walking in Their Shoes, uh, these workshops where we simply seek to hear stories um, that are not often told and learn from perspectives that maybe uh, are not our own. Uh, this month we're looking at uh, being Asian in America because in this last year it's being reported that hate crimes against Asians have increased by a staggering 150 uh, percent, which is mind-boggling. Uh, in, I read in New York City alone, it went from three uh, in the previous year to 28 this last year, hate crimes against Asians. So something is going on, and uh, we're simply seeking to hear stories, uh, to, to seek to learn uh, and, and understand, hopefully in a deeper level, um, from those who are experiencing this. Uh, today, you will watch um, four interviews, and in these four interviews, by the end, hopefully we'll have a better idea of, of what the experience is like right now to be Asian in America. So thank you for tuning in. Uh, this is important work, and I'm grateful that you are taking the time to do it. Well, hello and welcome, everyone. We're glad that you're watching this interview, um, Pastor David, and uh, this is Pa Lux, uh, who is so gracious to, to meet with us and to, to have a conversation just about some of her own experiences as we continue to hear stories. Um, and so, Pa, you were just uh, sharing with me a little bit about your family story uh, growing up in Catawba County. Yeah, we um, were one of the very first few families I mean, we came, we moved from um, St. Paul, Minnesota, okay. um, where my dad's family are. I mean, he has tons of families up there. That's where we were um, for about six years. And then we came to North Carolina. We're actually in Morganton. Okay. Um, but um, even then I can hear like my parents talking about like just driving to like the local I don't know, Food Lion. I remember like Food Lion has been around forever. And I remember going there and, um, you know, the kids, I have three sisters and a brother, we all in the car. And um, sometimes people would just hunk at us and just tell us to go back to our country. Oh. And so, you know, that um, is an experience. Um, yeah. And so as a young child, you know, just with your family in the car and having that happen, what does that do to your how you view yourself, your identity, you know, especially in those formative years? Well, I think it definitely I mean, I was so young that because it wasn't like to me in my face, but yeah. I heard my parents talking about it. It really made me question um, question. The big question is, why are we here? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, we're not wanted. Why are we here? You know, like. And the other thing is safety. I mean, are we safe here? Sure. You know, um, and no one's like ever come up to our faces when I was with my parents. Mm -hmm. um, but then growing up, um, that was Morganton. And we only lived there for a little bit, uh, about a couple of years. And then we moved to Hickory and I was like in the sixth grade. And I went to um, a middle school um, in Hickory. And although, you know, a lot of the teachers were really, really nice, all the teachers I've had um, were nice and had a lot of, a lot of nice, nice friends, but there were, there was this one boy. And I remember in the sixth grade and we're in the library, we're in the library and we're doing our own work. And the teacher wasn't like close to me or him, but we're doing something. And he just like, and I can I can't remember his name, but I remember what he said. He said, he just looked at me and said, your grandfather killed my grandfather. He just kept saying it and saying it. And I was like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. And he's like, your grandfather killed my grandfather. And so I was thinking, no, he didn't. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was in the sixth grade. <laughs> and so anyways, um, he just wouldn't stop. And I just started crying. Like, I remember, I'm like, I don't even know what you're talking about. And then the teacher asked me, like, what's wrong, you know? And so I told, I told um, them what happened, but, uh, and he got in trouble. Yes. But still, to me, I didn't know. It wasn't until later that I realized why he had said that. It was during the Vietnam War. But see, I had no idea. So I know that he was people, his parents or someone close to him. That's what they were telling him mm -hmm. about Asians. 
Yes. And he saw yeah. you and thought, okay, you look different than me. Mm -hmm. You must, you could be Vietnamese. And so I'm almost harboring anger against you as a representative of that person in my mind that took away something I love. Right. Exactly. And at I had no idea what he was talking about, you know, and then, like I told you, it was later on until I realized, and you know, it's crazy because the things that people say to you, like to me, like I still remember that till this day, sure. you know, and I didn't connect it until it was later in my life that I realized wow. um, that, um, but, and there are other stories, um, you know, in high school, I went to a high school that there was, I think in the whole high school, there's probably like six Hmong kids. Um, and I was one of those. And those people were not nice either. You know, like they were not nice. They were, I mean, and, and kids can be the meanest. I mean, yeah. in elementary school, I can say that all the kids that I've encountered in elementary school prior to sixth grade have been so like accepting yeah. and so kind and so nice because um, we didn't have a lot. But when we lived in Morganton, um, there were um, church families that would give us like their children's clothes. And it was like, I went to the mall because I got all these nice clothes, you know, people take it for granted, but I was happy to have the get the hand, hand me downs. They were awesome clothes. Um, but after the sixth grade, that's when I realized that kids can be really, really, really cruel and really, really mean. Yeah. And, they, it, it, and it got worse as I got older um, into the high school. And like I said, I went to a predominantly white school. There weren't a lot of um, African-Americans and definitely not a lot of Hispanics at that time. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, there were the Asians, which were, like I said, a handful of us. And yeah, people, I mean, kids were mean. They would... They say things like ching ching chong when I walk by or um, or just make rude comments. Um, yeah. And that's one of the ones that I remembered yes. um, yeah. that they said um, or they would. And there's this one time this kid like I was he never he didn't do this to anybody else, but he only did this to me. And one time I was like, I think I was a ninth grader or 10th grader um, in um physical science because I remember exactly where it happened okay. and I weren't friends with a lot of kids just because I don't know that I felt really safe with a lot of kids yeah. you know but there were some kids that were really nice that um I kind of gravitated towards and um we we're doing our project and like I said this kid I mean I I don't I'm one of those people I don't say anything especially I don't want to start trouble I'm not going to say anything that's what my parents have taught me you know you know, like keep to yourself don't say anything unless you have to so I was that kid and if you notice um maybe not so much now but the trend is Asians are really like quiet they usually are quiet they're not very outspoken um you know and I think that's I mean like we're coming out of our shelf I think it's because times are changing yes but back when I was in high school yes. my parents would always say like don't say anything don't you know bring attention to yourself wow. because that gives people a reason to be mean it really does wow so well um and, you know. and speaking about that i know talking with you earlier we've been talking about some of the asian hate that has you know bubbled up uh this past year and thank goodness you have said you didn't experience any oh. firsthand um but why do you why do you think that this has become such an issue in the last year or so? You know, I don't know. I really thought that things were getting better. I really think this is just my personal opinion, and I'll I'll put it out there as a disclosure so everybody knows. I don't watch the news because it's depressing. <laughs> I don't watch. I don't keep up with the Democratic and the Republican debates because I hate it. It's <laughs> the place to play to be. Um, people have their own opinion. I respect that. And I don't really watch the news. Um, sorry, the bell just rang. That's okay. So, I guess we forgot to introduce you work at a school. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think sometimes, you know, I think sometimes, you know, I think Asians in this country are successful. You know, they're, they work hard. Many of them work hard. Um, 
and many, many of them, like the generation before me, worked in really I mean, manual labor companies like my parents, mm. you know, and and my generation, I think, and even the ones that are here, like not even Hmong people, but I'm talking like Japanese and Chinese people that have been way, way here, way before, you know, um, the Hmong people even came, um, you know, like the third generation Chinese or third gener generation Japanese, um, I think they're really successful. Um, and I think sometimes, you know, when other people, I'm not just talking about, you know, Caucasians or African American, I think when they look at them, sometimes I do think they're a little bit, um, I don't know, maybe they feel a little jealous, they feel a little bit like, um, because we, are, a lot of us are successful. Sure. You know, because we work hard to get where we are. Yes. Um, and so, you know, there's lots of Asians with businesses. Um, and I just think that's part of it because they have their own business and they work hard. And, and even in the schools and even in academics and education, they work hard. Yes. So many of them are, um, you know, they do well academically. They're at the top of their class or they're close to it and they perform well. You know, so, I mean, if you just look at the statistics, I think, you know, sometimes people wonder, like, why? What's so special about you guys? Mm. You know, so, and, yes. and that, that unsureness of, you know, like, what's out there with, like, the Chinese gaining all this power, the biggest population powerhouse. And I think sometimes I think that plays a big role into it. And it's just that, it's just that, you know, they're just un unsure, they're just unsure of, of who we are and what our agenda is. Yes. And, and then again, sometimes I think too, that it's like a scapegoat to everything, like the pandemic, mm. you know? So I just think um, that's part of the reason. I mean, sometimes people have to blame somebody. If you look through, like, like they blame the Jews for everything that was bad back then, sure. you know? So I think sometimes, unfortunately, certain groups of people, certain groups of race become, um, like a scapegoat for things that people have no explanation for. So um, since uh, the pandemic just happened to originate in China, uh, mm -hmm. then not only the Chinese, but anyone who could look Chinese, you know, anyone mm -hmm. who's Asian might be scapegoated to say, oh, you're somehow responsible for what yeah. happened. Yeah, yeah, and um, that's unfair. I think that's ignorant of people to think, you know, like I said, people can think whatever they want, but, um, you know, I think you really have to understand that everyone's different. Yeah. And if you, if we give somebody a chance, and I will say this, you know, people talk a lot about Hispanics, like the um, immigration laws, mm -hmm. you know, I can't, and I'm a U.S. citizen, but, and I know lots of Hispanics who are not citizens, you know, who are here because they're seeking something else. They're seeking a better life. Yes. And I get that. And, you know, if I meet someone that's not a citizen of the United States, that's a Hispanic, and I know them, I don't want them to be deported. They're good people. How can I look at them in the face and say, you're this or you're that? And and then again, the same can be said, if you know me, how how, do, how can you, like, not like me. I mean, I'm sure some people don't like me. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm just saying, like, if you got to know me, how can you look at me with the same lens that you used to? We don't give people chances is what I'm saying. Right. That you are yeah. you. You don't yeah. represent some stereotype that can all right. be thrown into, you know, one grouping. You are you. Right. You just are you. Yeah, exactly. And so I think we have to give people that chance. And I think like, um, like, you know, we're saying if you group or lump me with everyone, you're not going to get a chance to know me. You're going to automatically write me off. Yes. And you're, and you're not. It's just part of like just being ignorant, ignorant, you know, just yeah. not yeah. doing your research. And I think part of it, too, is when they're so everyone is so influential, influenced by the media. Mm. They're so influenced by what they read on Facebook. Yes. They're so influenced by what their friends and the parents think that they don't take that time to do their own research. Sure. sure. You know, and make their own opinion. I think that's a lot of what's wrong. Absolutely. Well, and, and so we've talked about so many of these kind of uh, larger kind of systemic issues that are, are happening 
Um, and we as a church, you know, are, are going to be watching this conversation and then talking about it and others. Do you have any ideas of, of how a church could could help, you know, move this conversation forward um, to hopefully a, a better place in this country? Well, I think, you know, your church just, you know, standing up and just doing what we're doing, like, you know, let's give people a chance. We really, we, if you don't know, then try to get to know them before you make any kind of judgment. Yes. You know, I think just advocating that everyone's different and, um, and just, you know, just being the Christian that you guys are, yeah. you know, yeah. what everything that, that Christians stand for is that get to know your neighbor, love your neighbor yeah. and see them for who they are and stop seeing them for the color or how they dressed or whatever stereotype you have going on for you. And that not your mom or your dad isn't always right. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, see for yourself, you know, like we've got a chance to really change the world. And I really think that as people, we have to start with ourselves. Yeah. So, you know, as a congregation, you know, you go out there and um, you be the leader and you be that person to, you know, make that change. And I just feel like part of it is it, it starts with us. So if I go and I treat somebody right, it's going to start with me. It's going to start with you and your whole congregation. I think that you guys doing this is um, and getting, you know, the conversation going lets everyone see that this is important. We have to treat everybody, you know, we have to give everybody a chance. We have to treat everybody with love, yes. um, just like Jesus or God would. Yeah. And so, and, and let me just say that, you know, I've always wanted to come back to God. So I'm glad, I mean, I've always been this person, but um, I feel like I know him a lot more. And I know that um, by us doing this, it is exactly what he would have wanted, uh -huh. what he would want. That's wonderful. I, I think so. Yeah. So thank you so much for taking the time and, you're and welcome. your story. It's, it's powerful. It's important. And you're right. We, we need to do more of this. So thank yeah, you. Yeah. And, and just stand up. I would say just stand up. If you see someone, like if you see someone um, say things that are, are not very nice to someone else, you know, you don't have to, um, you don't have to address that person that's being mean, but you can sure support that person that's receiving it because not all of us feel brave enough to look that mean person in the eye and say, you know what, oh, we're ready to fight, you know, for that other person. But I think what we can do is let the other person know, hey, I hear you, he's not right. And it doesn't matter, I'm here and I don't care what he says. Mm -hmm. um, and awesome. so be that support. And what struck me is that, I mean, you still remember back even from sixth grade comments. And so, you know, those stick with us. Uh, and, they stick with us for a long time. And it would stick with us if then someone came beside you in that moment, too, and said, hey, I support you. I'm here for you. Um, yeah. At any age, you know, that's that's so important to do. Yeah. And, and people don't realize, and I always tell my students, and this is why I just, it's so impactful is, you know, the kind things that you do, you know, people will remember, but the mean things that, that you do to people, they'll remember it as well. And sometimes forever. Yes. So be kind, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's as simple as that. Be kind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. Well, welcome to our next video uh, in this workshop series the, as we're going beyond the walking in their shoes. Um, I'm here with a, a child of the church, uh, Evan, who grew up here. Uh, when did you first start coming to Unity? Since I was a baby. And, yeah. <laughs> and do you have any like early memories of being here at church? I remember, I think the first thing I remember was when we had Christmas and there, you had right. the big Christmas tree okay. in the gathering. Yeah. Oh, that is so fun. And you're now in college. Tell yes. us where you're going and what you're majoring in. I go to UNC Charlotte, and I am a senior. And I am majoring in multimedia design and creative writing. That is wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you for sitting down and, of course. and talking with us a little bit today, doing these workshops. Um, just tell us a little bit about yourself. What are some of your hobbies, interests, anything like that? Well, um, I obviously love church. I think that 
growing up in church it's made me have a strong faith mm -hmm. and I also love the outdoors and enjoying nature. Okay, like hiking, hiking. Mm -hmm. So I was a uh, I'm a I was a Boy Scout here, um, okay. and I am an Eagle Scout. So you know, outdoors has always been something that I enjoy. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Congrats on the Eagle Scout. Thank you. That's a big accomplishment. Yeah. And uh, let's see. You went to I think Montreat a couple times. Yes. Tell us what was that like. It's um, probably one of my most favorite experiences. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, connecting with other people that share the same ideas as you and yes. creating long-term friendships yes. it's a lot, means a lot to me. Well, that's so good. Mm -hmm. Well, so this whole experience is just about hearing other people's stories. And so we want to hear your stories, um, particularly as uh, an Asian in America right now. I, I know I've been just shocked at this last year. Uh, I read just today an article that said um, hate crimes against Asians have increased by 169%, which just baffles me. Um, uh, do you have any idea why this is happening? Uh, and I guess the next question is, is it affecting you in any way? I think the main thing is because of the coronavirus that, I, that people think that when it came from China that it's their fault and they just, people get this like hatred mm. towards it because they're frustrated of what COVID has done to our lives, you yes. know? And they just, I feel like that most people just take their anger out because, you know, we've been through so much mm. and, you know, it's been such a long year that, you know, it just builds up. Yeah. And for me particularly, I think that I, I haven't experienced it as much because with quarantine, you know, I've been at home most of the time. Yes. So I haven't really, you know, been out and experienced it. You know, it's all it's obviously, you know, on social media. But for mm -hmm. me, I tend to, you know, stay away from it, especially yeah. nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's very astute where you're you're saying, OK, people have been just uh, kind of kept to themselves in a high stress situation over this whole past year. And so some in, I mean, we're all feeling stress and some then are trying to get rid of that stress in a really negative way of almost, okay, let me find a group of people to blame. Um, yeah, I think you're probably very right that that might be the, the, dr the driver of some of this because pre COVID, did, did you hear much of this going on at all? Not that I know of. I mean, you know, it's obviously out there, but, sure. you know, with the, you know, they have something that you can actually put it on blame, like mm. this, like, physical blame mm. because of what, you know, China has been through and, like, the spread of it. They have something that they can physically put a blame on. Yeah, which is so frustrating because, I mean, as Christians, we should look at that situation going, wow, China got hit really hard by this. We should pray for them. We should send humanitarian aid. We should help in some way. But instead, it's like, oh, let me, because they happen to be the place where it started, let me blame them. That's just, it's disappointing. Um, so what was it like, um, like here in Denver? I know Denver is a very kind of Caucasian area, um, and you've been here since basically almost birth. Um, what was that like for you to, to grow up as a minority in Denver? I think, I know I was talking to my dad that in North Lincoln that you have like the percentages of race and that the Asians, they didn't count as race because they didn't have the percentage. So, um, so you weren't even a percentage. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there's not as many Asians. Um, I know growing up we had, I, I'm a twin yeah. and there's also another set of twins that are from Vietnam okay. that we grew up with together. And I guess we were like the only Asians mm. that we knew of or associated with. Okay. And for the most part, I think that I haven't, I never experienced like prejudice or racism towards me. I think that for the most part, you know, we were seen as, you know, human yeah. and not for our skin color. Yeah. And I think that you know, now it's different when you grow up and people, you know, you don't, as a child, you don't necessarily associate someone with the race. You just see them as 
who they are. Just a fellow mm -hmm. human being. Yeah. And then when you grow up, you under you start to understand it more. And with society, you know, now it's you know you go up and you learn the prejudice compared mm -hmm. to back then. You know, you grow up and you don't. So in mm. here, you know, most of the people I grew up with, they didn't have that yes. prejudice when they were they were they weren't taught that. Yes. Yes. Well, it sounds like you just had such a good upbringing in this particular church. And I really feel like the role of the church in this sort of thing has to be to respond in some way, to, to help in some way. I mean, when I see this going on, it, it grieves my heart. And so do you have any ideas of how a church like Unity could respond in a positive way uh, to what we're seeing? Because I know I personally, I just feel helpless when I watch the news and see this going on and go, what can I do? Uh, you know, is, is there anything the church can do? I mean, there are things, you know, you can do, but I think that it starts with, you know, with yourself and in the community. And then, because, you know, you, you everyone, I, I, I would hope, would want the idea to, you know, help change the world, you yeah. know, that type of idea. Yeah. But I think that everything, you have to look at yourself and go through life, you know, just your day-to-day -day life yeah. and truly like before, you know, you do, when you do things, you know, think about what you're doing. Mm. I think that's what makes a difference, especially now since COVID is lighting up as you go out, you know, and just remember all that we went through mm. during COVID mm. and take that with you as we go out because if we don't, then, you know, the same thing could happen again. You yeah. know, we could experience it again. Yeah. And, you know, and I like what you said. It's it's almost about empathy of saying, okay, what would that feel like if your group was targeted for some reason that you had nothing to do with? And it could happen again to a different group. Mm -hmm. And so kind of, again, walking in their shoes, saying, what would that feel like for me <laughs> if if I was targeted? for no reason, what would that kind of feel like? And I like how you said it It starts with yourself. It doesn't necessarily start with a group of people. It starts with these kind of individual hearts. Um, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Because I think that's a really powerful concept. How, if a person understands they've got some work to do, you know, how, how does that work begin? Well, especially with COVID, everyone has gone through some struggle and to be able to understand what your struggle is and know that you know it was a hard struggle or whatever yeah. you went through understand that you're not the only person that went through a struggle whether it be something similar or something less or worse yeah to have that common ground of saying you know I went through this so I and you know it was hard yeah. but this person also went through something mm. so that knowing that, you know, you have that common ground. You yeah. understand that, you know, we both went through something. So it's about trying to see that common humanity in mm -hmm. people, trying to see, okay, what makes us um, similar to one another? And th that idea that we're all kind of children mm -hmm. of God and really drawing, drawing into that. Uh, I like that a lot. Um, well, good. So as a church as we're studying these topics, is there anything else that you'd want to say that you think would just be helpful for us in this journey? I am not quite sure. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things that, you know, in this world that is happening, but I think taking it, you know, one step at a time yeah. is the main thing because you can't just, you know, jump to that one goal, the ultimate goal That's of, right. you know, peace and everything you yeah. had to take it one step at a time yeah so i think being able to go day to day yeah. and just reflect on you know what you've been through and how you mm -hmm. can improve it so we can't fix everything at once <laughs> no but exactly. maybe this is taking a step yeah yeah well i appreciate your willingness to share your story uh and particularly with the church who has known you for so many years so thank you very thank much you. i appreciate thank it you. Hi everybody, my name is Justin Ewan and I really appreciate this opportunity to share my story with you all. Since it's uh, been Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month, uh, I've been doing a lot of reflecting on 
the events of the world currently and the movement to stop Asian hate. And I really believe that sharing stories with one another is such an important part of uh, getting to know each other and making the world a better place. Uh, as my family knows, I tend to like to tell stories about my life, sometimes repeatedly, but not so much uh, about you know how I've been affected as an Asian uh, American. And I really haven't been able to uh, share and talk about um, some of these stories and some of these issues. And uh, to be honest, it's been uh, kind of hard mentally to get over that um, uh, mental block of recording some of these uh, stories and sharing it with you all. But I'm really happy to uh, be able to do this um, with you right the now. The theme I wanted to focus in on with you all today and that I think in looking back, uh, some of these stories uh, relate to is the concept of color blindness. And, you know, as I've gone through life and different experiences, I've had to learn and adapt and, and change how I've kind of approached uh, how I felt about that concept of color blindness. I think in some ways uh, it had a lot of promise about um, treating or seeing people as equals. Um, on the other hand, I think it also may have uh, led to stereotypes and also um, a, a lack of understanding of uh, an ability to share one story uh, before uh, being put into a box or lumped in um, with other people that you may not have had the same experience with. When I was in third grade, and uh, went through the rite of passage that is a McDonald's play place uh, birthday party that a friend was holding in the playground area there. Uh, unfortunately, had an experience that uh, made me realize that, you know, I I'm different. And so uh, another kid who was not at the party uh, called me a chink and uh, friends stood up for me as much as they could at that age. And it really, made me realize that, um, you know, the ideals of colorblindness, um, you know, did not exist. It made me acutely aware that I was going to be perceived as something different, something foreign, and, you know, would make it hard to fit in. So naturally, what did I do? Um, tried to fit in. And I think the, the next stage of childhood um, resulted in, in me looking in the mirror one day in high school and thinking to myself, when I look in the mirror, I think I'm white. And so not fully seeing that person looking back in the mirror uh, with my own Asian American identity. And it really started me thinking about um, how to explore and come to grips with uh, both fitting in and also understanding my own identity. Um, Fortunately, in high school, uh, where I grew up in Princeton, New Jersey, I was then able to be a part of an Asian American Pacific Islander uh, club and share experiences and learn uh, from the other students. And it resulted in a, a great project that we did, which really helped me uh, learn more about the history of Asian Americans uh, in the United States where we pr presented a packet of information for the English teachers and also for the history teachers, um, along with a study guide um, that the teachers could then share with students to help everybody learn more about uh, Asian American Pacific Islander heritage during um, the month of May back in high school. So I was really able to uh, learn more and reflect uh, heading into college, uh, where at, at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, and the classes I took there uh, allowed me to go deeper into some of these uh, issues, um, race relations, um, uh, Asian history, and uh, literature, Asian American literature, um, which better equipped me uh, for uh, future experiences um, as an Asian American. One of the summers during college, I had the chance to visit uh, Roanoke, Virginia, and heading over to the Piggly Wiggly, <laughs> Uh, was able to uh, talk to some of the folks who were working in the uh, cash register area and they were uh, extolling the virtues of their the wonderful town and 
uh, mentioned the mountains that were uh, within the city limits and then asked me about, well, you know, made a comment. Uh, you probably have uh, big mountains in the country you come from too. And um, another experience while I was there, I went to kind of a, uh, a country fair, county fair type event and ordered uh, from a vendor um, a chicken dish and uh, before handing it to me, kind of pulled their hand back and said, oh, before I give this to you, can you tell me what ch how to say chicken in your own language? Uh, so uh, although it was uh, <laughs> uh, unexpected um, or hadn't had the comments like that, you know, made around me, um, you know, I felt like it, you know, through my experience was better able to cope with the feelings in kind of the knee jerk reactions of feeling like a foreigner um, and, and being perceived as someone who wasn't born in the U.S. And, and in my case, um, you know, I, I was born in the U.S. And so um, and it really allowed me to, you know, take a step back and, and to reflect on um, perhaps, you know, people not uh, come across uh, people who are Asian American before there. And so that was their, you know, perception. And so to kind of extend a little bit of patience, you know, from, from my end as I process those emotions. After graduation, I was fortunate enough to get a job at Nike in um, Oregon. And so I had a big dream of wanting to move out to the West Coast, enjoy the natural beauty of Oregon and the Pacific Northwest and exploring and uh, having uh, loved sports growing up. Um, felt like it was a uh, dream job and uh, gave opportunities uh, for me to to learn from uh, great coworkers, and you know be able to build my career. Uh, the one of the things that was you know I didn't maybe anticipate was uh, feeling like um, I was more of a novelty <laughs> as I uh, got used to living in Oregon in terms of you know questions or or comments um, that again I kind of chalked up to. Um, the lack of exposure maybe with people with my background or how I looked and also, um, you know, uh, felt like maybe there were less um, stereotypes than maybe I'd grown up with uh, in terms of um, being in New Jersey or the Northeast in terms of the uh, model minority or the perception that um, Asians, you know, would be good at math or science and um, excel in those areas, which I wasn't necessarily the strongest at. And so in some respects, it was maybe refreshing that people didn't have those preconceived notions, although, you know, it was, it was a bit complicated by the fact that uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, still being kind of perceived as a foreigner. And I think um, upon reflection, um, it bottled up into all that is what um, Asian Americans go through in terms of, uh, for example, in my case, uh, parents who uh, came over, uh, immigrated from um, in their case, Hong Kong, to go to college in the U.S. And, um, you know, challenges feeling that uh, because my um, Chinese language ability was not up to, to par or uh, my knowledge of customs, you know, that they um, might want me to uh, be a part of, um, you know, I wasn't as well. <laughs> I didn't embrace as much. And so I think uh, wrapped up in all of that are those complex feelings that um, some Asian Americans uh, can feel uh, caught between uh, the country uh, that um, of their you know family origin and the country that they're living in, and so uh, that's definitely uh, something that you know I'm still navigating uh, to this day and um, feel uh, that is a work in progress on my part. Related to that, a lesson that I learned uh, after moving to Amsterdam, had the opportunity to work at Nike's European headquarters there, uh, saw a group of um, Chinese Dutch uh, kids hanging out together in one of the town squares. And initially when I saw them speaking Dutch to one another and uh, my perception was, wow, you know, that's, that's so weird. Like, look, they're, you know, they're, they're speaking Dutch and they, and they're, uh, you know, of Chinese background. And it was this big whoa moment to say that knee jerk reaction um, is what, you know, others might <laughs> see uh, when they see me speaking 
uh, American English in in the U.S. And so it it really kind of drove home to me that um, I need to keep learning. I also need to check what biases or stereotypes I might have or have internalized. And so um, it was a real kind of, you know, wake up moment to say, um, you know, I am not perfect and no one else is perfect. Um, but also having gone through, um, you know, uh, other complex uh, situations, you know, in the Netherlands where on one hand being an expat, um, you know, employee of a multinational company, um, Dutch or other Europeans would perceive me, you know, in that context. And then in others, just walking around the streets uh, would have comments, you know, said to me about, you know, being a foreigner and, um, and, and you know, stereotyping, you know, who I might be um, with another identity. So um, it was, again, another kind of um, another situation being presented to myself where I was examining both my own identity or sense of self and then also um, understanding the broader context of uh, how um, colorblindness, um, you know, may be a, um, a challenge um, and also how I would want, you know, to help um, spread positivity, but also understanding of each other's stories. The last group of stories I want to share with you relate to um, the topic of um, the fact that so many uh, Asian American Pacific Islanders have such different um, life experiences and backgrounds. And so I think a lot of that kind of comes back to um, this notion of family and how uh, we help one another, teach one another, and pass along stories to one another. When I moved back to Oregon uh, after being in uh, Amsterdam, had the wonderful, you know, opportunity and uh, experience uh, to become a dad. Um, wife Katrina and I have two uh, great kids, uh, Melina and Lucas. And through that experience, um, had another perspective of uh, being being parents and helping them uh, navigate uh, being Asian American. Also. Parallel to that, as that was happening, um, both Katrina and I were able to get involved in the community, uh, get more involved and in, in, informed about um, uh, communities of color, uh, social justice, and um, equity. And so from those experiences, uh, got to hear, meet, learn, work with um, people from all kinds of backgrounds and and just to underscore um, how different everyone's uh, situation uh, was growing up and currently as Asian Americans um, in Oregon and also um, beyond community and working together on these issues um, has been incredibly inspiring and I think has helped you know us as a family at home have uh, conversations when um, situations have come up um, together. A number of years ago, we were at a uh, museum out in the beautiful Gor Columbia River Gorge area of Oregon, and the tour guide, um, you know, was pointing out a bald eagle that they had at the museum and turned to us as a family and asked us what was the national bird from the country we came from. And to add um, insult to injury in terms of not you know, of the family not feeling like uh, we belonged, a uh, woman, uh, when we were momentarily stunned, <laughs> uh, a, another woman in the uh, group um, walked closer to us and spoke kind of slowly and loudly, and, you know, with the assumption that we didn't speak English, repeating <laughs> the question loudly and slowly um, to our family's face. And, um, you know, that that was definitely something that um, the kids at their younger age at that time uh, needed some time to process and for us to talk through. Um, more recently, in the past year, um, there were, um, you know, comments, uh, you know, to to the family as we're walking around. Um, uh, the kids, when I was actually, wasn't actually there, um, 
about them uh, being foreigners, yelling out, you know, foreign language, sometimes gibberish, and as they're walking around. And so it's really, um, you know, difficult, I think, um, during the pandemic to be all be processing so many of these um, things that are happening in the world and, and, and feeling um, on top of that, um, again, being reminded of, of being the other um, in those situations. So I think really how we all can move forward together and reflecting on all these stories um, as I've been talking through these with you all, and thank you so much for listening, that, you know, the, the, the colorblindness concept um, really, you know, I think the ideals of how I would better describe how I would love to be viewed is that, you know, yes, I think we all want to be viewed upon as human beings and, and, and not, you know, with, uh, you know, racism or stereotypes or discrimination, um, that we consider one another, you know, equals and all of that, but also the opportunity to share with each other the stories of our experiences, where we come from, because we are, uh, have so many, you know, we are, we have so many differences in that respect. So balancing the two, you know, um, you know, meeting everyone where they're at, understanding and learning, uh, hearing where they um, come from and and moving forward together and embracing all that is unique um, about our experiences and finding common ground to help make the world a better place. Uh, thank you so much for um, the opportunity to share my story today. We're here today with Jeanette Pai Espinosa president of National Crittenden Foundation. And it is Asian American and Pacific Islander Month. And we've asked Jeanette to speak to us and tell us a little bit about her upbringing and her history. Jeanette? Hi, Cherise. Thanks for, thanks for having this conversation with me. Um, yeah, I, I actually am the, uh, my ancestry is Korean. And I am the first child on both sides of my family to be born in the United States shortly after the Korean War. So my parents immigrated here uh, from Korea about 1955 and I was born in 57. Uh, my, my ancestry, my lineage is very much tied to the Presbyterian church. Uh, my grandfather, uh, Min Soo Pai, was one of the first Protestant mis ministers in South Korea he actually went to uh, divinity school in the United States um, and following in his tradition as sort of a social justice revolutionary in Korea. Um, my, my, both of my parents were also on the boards of the Princeton and the McCormick Seminary. And so uh, as we like to joke, we're big P uh, Presbyterian. Uh, but my, my grandfather and my great grandfather on my father's side uh, both fought for the liberation of the Korean people. Uh, both against the Chinese and the Japanese. My great grandfather was actually executed um, in Korea by the, the Japanese for his uh, activities in organizing in rural parts of the community. So that's my history. I'm very connected to it. Um, I actually grew up in, I was born in New Jersey. I grew up in Kansas City, Missouri, and also in Kansas, uh, where I was really nested in a strong Korean. Uh, community, um, but lived in very white, very, very white communities in Missouri, sort of rural, uh, and then in Kansas, suburban. So um, I really struggled. I struggled a lot growing up with being an Asian person in a predominantly white environment, um, really without any other people of color. My graduating class, I graduated from Shawnee Mission South in Kansas, uh, and my graduating class was 800, and there were... Um, I think five students of color, including me in that graduating class. So I struggled a lot to find my place in the world. It was difficult, it was difficult. That's quite a rich history that you have, Jeanette. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how that uh, history has kind of shaped where you are today in your career? Sure, sure. I mean, I think um, I think just experiencing sort of invisibility and isolation as a young Asian girl, young woman, and then woman 
Um, plus my family history, right, of activism really pushed me into the work I do now, which is national advocacy for uh, cis and trans uh, young women and gender expansive young people to really sort of fight against the marginalization and the oppression um, on a larger scale than what I experienced, but I certainly experienced living under the sort of stereotypes about Asian women as submissive on the one hand, um, also over-sexualized and fetishized, that's a hard word to say, um, and which continues today, being perceived as a foreigner, uh, never feeling like I, I would ever be perceived as an American, which is true to this day. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, I'm 64 now, so I can look retrospectively, but I think that struggle for place and belonging um, push me as a young person, as a teenager to be involved in, you know, drugs, drinking, early sexual activity, you know, um, I stole a couple cars, <laughs> really, uh, for lack of figuring out um, where did I belong, because I wasn't really Korean enough um, to be deeply embedded in that Korean community. But I also clearly was not um, I wasn't a white person and I, I really, I think at that age just struggled to figure out what I could adapt of my Korean culture and what I could adapt about being in this United States uh, was a struggle and it was a struggle for my parents. You know, they were both immigrants. Um, they were in their late twenties when they immigrated. Um, they did both speak English. So I had that benefit. They both attended college, um, but, but it was a struggle and it was a struggle that I see in the young folks that we work with today. Uh, it is, it is. I think, you know, you, you see as of late, the anti-Asian hate increases in that and the, the demonization of the Chinese as being uh, the causes of COVID. And I think what it says to me is that things have not changed as much as we would hope they would. And so uh, we continue the work, working in alliance with other uh, communities of color to create some justice and make some change. Um, I wouldn't change. I wouldn't trade being a Korean American for anything. Uh, my kids are pretty deeply rooted in it too. Um, but, but it has been a struggle. Um, and it's a struggle that I have shared um, in an article actually that just appeared in Ms. Magazine online about the experience that I shared with a woman. Her name is Tina Chen. She worked in the Obama White House and now she's, she's still really uh, active politically in terms of um, justice for women. Uh, and I, I will share that link because it, it, it says a little bit about how um, even when you, you live and work at the highest levels of power in a country, I mean, Tina worked in the White House, uh, you can be, your true self can be made invisible. And I think that's, um, that's sort of the bottom line of, of the struggle. The upside is, you know, we do have more power and more representation now. Uh, but the bigotry that perpetuates the anti-Asian uh, hate and that uh, is embedded in the story that Tina and I tell uh, is still alive and well. Wow, Jeanette, you are such a phenomenal professional and you have had such a great impact on the women and girls. And listening to you today, um, I can just see how your lived experiences really helps you to lean into and push for change for marginalized individuals within our, within our country. If you could leave our audience with one um, piece of advice, uh, what would that be? Well, one piece of advice. I think my advice would be, be really clear about what your core values are and don't deviate from them. I think that's what's guided me through all the trouble I've gotten into, to my work, my education, my being a parent is uh, figure out what your true north, north is and stick to it. And thank you, Sharice. This has been great. Thank you so much, Jeanette. So there you have it. Stick to your true north and do not compromise your values. Thank you so much. And have Well, now that you've watched the videos, I want to say thank you and then invite you to one of our opportunities to discuss what you just saw. Um, this discussion will be an important time to say, okay, what does the church do next? Uh, now that we've heard these stories, now that we know a little bit about what is happening, what is the role of the church moving forward? So please join us in those discussions.